Welcome to the ICC Nairobi podcast, where we are all about raising godly generations. We're so glad you're here, and we believe that wherever you're listening to us from, this word will bless and minister to you. I was asked to share from Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6. Uh, If you are a preacher, you know that it would be difficult to share from two chapters. And so, uh, I was given the liberty to share as the Lord will read, and then in the next few uh, days, other uh, other speakers will come and they will clear the field because I'm just going to use two chapters for today. But I also said this is not a coincidence. It was God's divine plan. Because chapter 5 means a lot to me. Chapter 5 of Ephesians. Ephesians 5, especially verse 14 to 16, which I would like to read. It says, and uh, I'm reading from the NLT version. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper. Rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. Underline that if you are carrying a Bible. Fools, don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. And I had that uh, word 56 years ago, and that is the time I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. In August of 1967, I remember the day, I remember the timing, because it was very dramatic. My salvation was not easy. I had just been married for a few years, and those days, salvation was, the poor, was for the poor, the old, the agri, the agri and... Whoever didn't fit in any other society gets saved. <laughs> so, we used to look at people who are saved and say, how did, how did they get saved? So, on that night when I went to the church, it was a crusade in Kabete where we used to live, and I went to the crusade the first day, I was brought up as a Christian. I knew the Lord. I had been saved several times, like children would get saved several times. But uh, leaving those childish ones, this was a serious day now. So the speaker spoke. He was from Tanzania. I remember him very well. And he spoke on these words, and he said, you know, some people are dead. They are walking, but they are dead. And he said, on this first day of this crusade, I want to address the living dead. I said, what is that? Living dead. But the word was so powerful, it touched me to the core. I really considered salvation. Then I remembered my husband. He was working with the railways. He was stationed in Fort Hall, which is now Moranga. And I was living in Kabete with the children because I was going back to school. Therefore, I was saying now, how, how, how do I explain to my husband that I had to be saved? So... The first day I said, I can't, because if I get saved, he's going to chase me away. (laughs) The second day, the preacher went on the same word, awake or sleeper. And he went on to say, you know, some people are corpses. They are in their coffins. They are just waiting to be put down on the soil. And I said, my goodness, walking corpses, and I'm one of them. What do I do? And yet I can't be saved because I'll be chased away. I have these children. What will I do with the children? And I hadn't even gone back to school. You know my story, some of you. So I, I didn't get saved. But on the third day, this man said, you are not only dead, you are not only a corpse, <laughs> but you are going to hell. <laughs> I say, this is serious. I am dead. And if I continue being dead and get to deadest, I end in hell. Uh -uh. I said I have to get saved. So when he finished speaking, with the tears down my face, I walked to the altar. And I said, husband or no husband, I'll give my heart to the Lord. And I did. And then I went home that night. 
and I wrote a letter to my husband. I said, my dear husband, I want to apologize to you. I got saved. <laughs> Please forgive me. Just for you to understand how serious it was for people to get saved, people who were educated those days, uh, one friend of mine got saved. I didn't know her at that time. We got to know each other later. And her husband called the elders, the people they were playing golf with. The husband called those men and said, I want, to, I want my wife to talk in your presence. I understand that she got saved. I want her to tell you, what is it that I'm not giving her that Jesus will give her? <laughs> so the woman, with tears and a lot of submission, said, my husband, you are the best husband in the world. You are giving me everything. But you know there's one thing you can't give. That's eternal life. And that's why I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, back to my story, my husband, those are the days of uh, P.O. Box. You don't know, most of you don't know that. You know WhatsApp, you know messages, you know text, you know email. All those were not there. Even typing, there were no computers. We used to type with this machine, unafanya hivi. Una type hivi. And that's what I used to do in the Treasury Ministry of Finance. So anyway, my husband uh, wrote back after three weeks of suspense because I was saying now, what is he going to say? Sometimes I pack because I know he's going to chase me away. Other times I say, God, please have mercy. I didn't sin. I only got saved. Please let him understand. So three weeks later, I got a reply, opened with a lot of shaking. And the letter said, it's okay to be saved. I forgive you. <laughs> <clears throat> but never, ever tell anybody. You can see I'm so good, I'm not telling you. <laughs> Amen. So, that is how I got saved, and it was not easy. So, let me repeat that verse, Ephesians 5.14. Awake, O sleeper. And as I was preparing this message, the Lord put it very seriously on my heart to tell you people, that there are some of you that are dead in your trespasses. You have never given the Lord Jesus Christ your heart, even though you come to church. This is your day. Awake. Otherwise, you die here and you end up in hell. <laughs> That's the gospel. But if you are born again, but also not serving God, the Lord is saying, awake. There is so much to be done for the kingdom. And so I'll be calling later for those who need to be awake and do something for the kingdom and those who need to be saved. But don't go outside this door without accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever it will cost you, it will cost me everything. I was ready to leave everything for Jesus Christ. Are you ready for your salvation? Then, because I was told to talk from Ephesians 5, chapter 5 and chapter 6, again I jump to chapter 6 with a passage that I love so much about the armor of God. And this you can find in Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 18. I will not read all of, the, all of it. What I have done is to summarize the whole armor, what it contains. Number one, it contains the belt of truth. Belt of truth. Then, breastplate of righteousness. That way, the shoes of readiness to share the gospel. Fourthly, the shield of faith. The helmet of salvation, number five. Number six is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then number seven, it says, and pray always. Pray without ceasing. That's the armor of God. <clears throat> Sorry. And the Bible is saying, put on the whole armor. Some people put two pieces of the armor. That won't help you. If the enemy is against you and you only have to put two or three or four, even of six, the enemy will still get you. He knows which part of your body is not covered. Is that your mind? So that you are born again and you are on pornography? What part of your body is not covered? The devil knows. So put on the whole armor. You can study that. But because of time, I've chosen to just 
talk about two. Even then, I was, have to talk very quickly about them. But study this. By the time the pastor comes to do chapter 5 and chapter 6 of Ephesians, study it and you see how rich it is. So let's look at the belt of truth. We live in a day when truth is under attack. Our children are getting exposed to sources of information that contradict what we learned from God's word. Jesus Christ said of himself, I am the way, the truth. Can you say with me? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. Then in John 17, 17, the Bible says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So, for a Roman soldier, the belt supported his other armor, such as the sword. It held his clothes together so he could learn. The truth is our foundation to challenge and refute all contrary arguments. If you go into battle, not knowing why or what you are facing, you stand to lose. The examples of this detrimental use of truth is what we are facing in Shakahora right now. Kenya is still going through the shock of the Shakahora cult. Last night they said it's 430 people already exhumed, I think so. Hundreds led to suicide, thinking it is obedience to the Bible. What went wrong? Even well-educated people were captured by these unbiblical teachings. Why? Because of lack of truth. Truth about the gospel of salvation, redemption, and return of Christ. Many had little or no knowledge of the truth of God's word. And like the Berean believers, who would evaluate Paul's teaching against the written word of God, the victims at Shakahora did not weigh the teachings against the truth. The belt of truth guarantees the plumb line, Kabiro, which we measure every teaching against. If something doesn't align to God's revealed written word, it must be rejected with absolute conviction. Even this message of mine, evaluate it. And our online friends, as you are right there at home, evaluate the things you are watching on Terry and even this word, Bana Sifuiwe. So tighten your belt of truth. Let us look at the truth about procreation. I could have picked a few things about uh, the word of God vis-a-vis -vis the lies that are being told. But in Genesis 1, 27 and 28, the Bible says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of, in the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Today, children are being taught lies in the schools about procreation. They are being told one mother is good, but two mothers are better. One father is good, but two fathers are better. One mother will be making breakfast for you, while the other one is packing school books for you. That's why two mothers are good. And these children, because they are young and do not understand anything, they feel this is good. But you know, this is a lie from the enemy. It's a subtle attack against the truth of God on marriages. It is the lesbian agenda to legitimize lesbianism and homosexuality. So that when your children see two mothers living together and sleeping together, two mothers are good. Two daddies are good. And because you don't know what your children are being taught, 
you, you don't know how to teach them and you have not taught them the word of God. So we need to teach our children the truth, every part of the truth of the word of God. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bite them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. If we were to do a test today, many would fail. What have you put on your hand today? Is it the commandment or just Kenya? <laughs> the Bible is telling us, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk on the road. When you lie down, tie them, verse 8, tie them as symbols on your hands. What symbol is on your hand? I will not embarrass you, but look when you go home. What symbol is on your hand? The, the watch and the, a few other things, but not the word of God. That's how serious we are failing our children. Bible also says in Proverbs 22, 6, start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not depart from it. I do not have time to tell you that when I got saved, and I've told you about the salvation, one of the things that God taught me, no pastor, nobody told me, was to pray with my children. And while they were young, the five of them gave their hearts to the Lord. And they loved God. So I want to ask you, daddies, do you have time that you pray with your children? Or have you said that is mommy's work? Let me tell you, you give an account to God. It is the father who is to assemble the family. But when the husband like mine was not born again at that time, the mother can come in and do the work. So I brought the children and they got saved and we were going to, uh, to church together and everything was going on until my children told me that my son, Alex, had backslidden. Alex is my older son. And I'm saying this with his permission, I, otherwise I wouldn't mention him by name. But he has allowed me to use his testimony. He started drinking. When I was told that Alex is drinking, I almost got a heart attack. I said he can't be drinking. He has been my prayer partner, we are praying for dad. <laughs> <laughs> now he has joined dad's camp now who is with me. So I really cried. And you know, for 30 years he was drinking. I cried and prayed. And therefore, I know I'll not have a lot of time to talk about prayer. But I want you to tell you not to give up. Because after 30 years, 10 years ago, Alex stopped drinking. In fact, 11 years ago now. Many things happened in his life until he stopped. Today, he's attending a conference in USA of Celebrate Recovery. <clears throat> so, God answers prayer. But we need to talk to our children and to tell them and teach them by example. Is your altar decorated or is it functional? Do you even have an altar? Fight for your children. Because when they backslide, I used to remind the Lord, you know you told me. I bring him up in your way and he will not, uh, he will not be lost. And as I shared in the first service, have you ever found a train when it is derailed because the rail has a problem moving on the road? Have you ever met a train on the road? Have you? No, it can't because it is made to move on the rails. Equally so, when a Christian, your child whom you brought to the Lord backslides, they will have to come back because they can't move in any other way. They have to come back to the rail. And the rail is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So bring them up in the way of the Lord. The second armor I want to talk about is the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. The Bible says that those who win souls are wise. Proverbs 11.30. In the ministry that I read, Home Care Spiritual Fellowship, we are very intentional about outreach and evangelism. We neighbor Kebra slums. 
We felt clearly that God brought us there on Cabernet Road and we are housing one of your churches on Cabernet Gardens, that God brought us there for a special reason. We soon found out that God wanted us to work with the people of Kebera who are very, very deprived. And I remember when we started meeting there, four ladies came to see me. And they were both, all of them were HIV AIDS. And they later got admitted in hospital. And one of them sent word to me and said, tell Reverend to buy me a coffin. This is my last wish and request to her. I don't want to be uh, buried the way they bury people with HIV AIDS. Those of you, this is a young church, they, you don't know many of those things. You know people when they died of HIV AIDS, they were, they were tied with uh, polythene bags and thrown in a grave because people feared, just the same way we feared COVID. COVID. So this woman, this woman, Margaret, really feared to be thrown into the grave like that. So I bought her a coffin. I also bought her a white dress and she was buried. But something touched my heart so deeply. And something asked me, is there anything else you could do? And this is a question I want to throw to this church. Is there something you can do for, the, for your neighbors? You could be in Karen, Mirimani, you could be wherever. So it's not even just about slums. But even the people in those gated community, they need Jesus. Is there something you can do for them? Start thinking about that as I go on. And so I felt that I could do something about these women. The government was giving them medication, retrovirus, but not food. And when you get medication on an empty stomach, they were dying. That's why they were dying. So I felt we were going to feed them. I told the women that were praying with me because at that point, up to that point, our ministry was just a prayer ministry, praying for families, husbands, and children. I told those women, please, we all have something when we were making Ugari, something remained. Come with it, let's feed these women. We started feeding them and they were getting strong. And we were feeding about 40 of them every Thursday. And sometimes we would even buy them meat, they cook, and we would tell them, you are important. Have a good meal. So they started getting better. But one day, I was told they are hiding the food. I asked, why are you hiding the food? Now, when you don't eat, you are going to die again. They said, Leverage, looking me straight in the eye. How can a mother eat this kind of food when your children have had nothing for a whole week? I was touched to the core. I said, eat your food. I'll feed your children. At that point, there were 71. Again, I came to the mothers and my friends. I will call my friends. Whatever you have, whatever little money you have said to me, we need to feed these children. And people were gracious. People would even come through home care and drop money, 50,000, whatever. We had what you are doing. Feed the children. The feeding program today is 700 kids. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> to God be the glory. And we feed them every Saturday. We go to Kebera. The staff goes to Kebera and feeds the children. So one day I went to visit the program. And I saw the children are getting better, but they are not going to school. I said, you know what? We are going to educate criminals. If they don't go to school and now they are getting healthy, they will be into criminality. So I said, we might, I, I, I said, I said Holy Spirit, what are you saying? I felt, take them to school. I said, how? 71 children. How do you take 71 children? Long story short, we decided to do it by faith. We took those 71, and today we are taking 300 children to school. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You have seen with your own eyes. I came with a team from Kibera. Our Sareb is from Kibera. Storm or Salimi Atena. Give the Lord a better clap. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is not a respecter of people or places. They are brothers. The next one is Daniel. And the younger one of the three, Daniel, greet them. The other one is Moses. So Moses was in the feeding program. And he knew that his brother, Daniel, had been sent away from Embu University. 
And these children would go, one goes to school, the others don't, because their father is a, what you would probably call a watchman or a security guard. So he cannot feed six children, five boys and one girl. And so it was difficult for the father. So one child would go, and they are all very clever, very brilliant. Haven't you seen how brilliant they are? So, but they were not that way. This is what God has done. I want, to, I want you to know when we pick them, they were not that way. So, some, I mean, uh, Moses comes and tells me, you know, Leverett, my brother would like to see you. And said, let him come. And he went and told Daniel, Leverett said, you can come. He said, I can see Leverett. You mean I can just go to his, her office and see her? They couldn't believe. You know, these days, we ministers, we have become another creek altogether. You need to go through four or five doors before you get to the person. They couldn't believe that you can come to my office and go. And each one of you, you are welcome to my office. So anyway, uh, he came with a brother. And brother told me, I've been away, sent away for two years because of school fees. How I wish I can go back. I said, go to Embu, and if they are going to take you because you've missed two years, I'll pay for you. And these statements I make by faith. I don't even know where the money is coming from. I say, go, I'll pay for you. Remember, my ministry is voluntary. We are not a church. We don't have tithes. It's just people who come and pass by and help. Feed 700 children. Take to school 300. Feed 40 women with uh, HIV AIDS. Feed uh, 50 children who are doing dressmaking. Many, many things that I don't have time to tell you. So... Uh, Daniel went to school and he was told he can be taken. So I said, Daniel, I'll take you. He went back and this year, Daniel is going to uh, graduate with a software engineering degree. <laughs> Hallelujah. Moses, I told him, come and sit at our reception. Anything can happen. Today, he is back to school doing accounts. Praise the Lord. Our celeb, because the house is one room, and they were so squeezed, he would go outside near the railway in Kebera. That was his practicing platform. He would sing to the people that are passing by. Some of them, Wanamtukana, Wekino Wanasema, who are you? And the boy continued. Look at him. Look at what God has done. Has indeed been a blessing to you. Amen. Amen. Even him, he couldn't finish school, but he's doing very well now in music. They have a sister called Sarah. Because the house is so small, so they were sitting, I wouldn't even call it a chair, but whatever you call it, they are sitting next to each other. So when Daniel is doing software engineering on the computer, Sarah either has to look there or look in front. <laughs> so she decided to look. Today, she has graduated as a software engineer. And she is being hard hunted by international organizations. I won't even tell you the groups that are looking for her. This is what God can do, transforming a whole family. And we are working with them and we are saying, young men, let's see what God can help us do. Because the second AMA uh, th that we are dealing with today is putting on the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace, which is love, like the sun. You can't put shoes and then sit down. But so many Christians have put on swimming costumes and sat down. Some are even going to bed with a swimming costume because you don't want to move and do something. So I am grateful to God for touching this family. We have the dressmaking, like I said. Out of the ones that we have, have taken to school, I've shown you the three, but we have Sami. Sami, stand up. Greet them. Hallelujah. Sami is literally now my grandson. Sami was in the program. I went there and they were sharing testimonies, and Sami looked at me and I just loved him. But this is 13 years ago when he was so frail and so thin. If you see his pictures then and now, even he himself laughs at himself. <laughs> so I decided to bring him home, but I didn't know how to. 
I came home praying and saying, God, let, let my husband agree that I bring this young man home. I prayed for three days and God and my husband agreed that we brought Sammy home. He's been such a blessing. Today, Sammy has graduated, is graduating in November with a master's degree from Desta University. <laughs> Hallelujah. And not only that, three weeks ago he started work in a bank. He's a banker now. <laughs> Hallelujah. See what God can do. So I'm not talking about the old time religion. It was good for Paul and Cyrus. But we need to bring our salvation to putting on the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace and do something. And today, I want to challenge and encourage you. My challenge to each one of you is, can you reach your neighbor? Can you talk to that person in the office? If I decided I was the sonko, and I'm not going to talk to these people, can you imagine where they would be today? Uh, Daniel would be in Kibera throwing stones. Isn't it? Those throwing stones, it's not their fault. They have no opportunity. We can take some of them out through love and through putting on the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. So I want to bring this message to a close with a question. Ask yourself, if I don't touch my neighbors, who will? If I don't share the gospel, what will happen to them? When I stand before the judgment seat of God, what will I present? When others are bringing in the sheaves, what will I present? There are many ways of reaching out. Like I talked about the classes we have for the sewing machine. A sewing machine is 15,000. Many people here can afford a sewing machine or 10 or 15, but that's not my point. My point is, do what God tells you to do. Amen? Amen. Do what God tells you to do. Sometimes he tells you to do difficult things. The book that you are told about, Empty Seat, this came out of the death of my husband of 56 years. That was a big loss. And then within four months, God told me to write a book that will encourage people, especially those who have lost loved ones. I had to write this book with a lot of tears. Yesterday, it was one and a half years since he left, I went to lay hands on where we buried, I mean flowers on where we buried him, and I was thinking about this book and saying, God, to obey you is expensive. To obey you is costly. I am asking ICC, Mombasa Lord, all of you that are under my voice today, that you think of people, that if you don't reach them, nobody will reach them. If you don't know them, you know places and other people who are reaching out and you can work together with them. I want us to go to prayer. And I want us to go to prayer with these questions. If I don't touch them, if I don't share with them, who will? And when I go before judgment seat, what will I tell the Lord? Let us pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Pray for yourself. You know, when you say, I'll go home and think, sometimes we don't go home and think. We go home and start cooking or go for lunch or anything like that. I want you to tell yourself before you leave this place, Lord, I've heard your voice. If I'm sleeping, if I'm a walking corpse, today I want to give my heart to the Lord. And if you're here and you have never given your heart to the Lord, I would like to ask you to please stand wherever you are. You've never given your heart to the Lord. Time will not allow me to dwell there a lot but you've never given your heart to the Lord, would you please stand up? And while you're standing, if this message has touched you and you're asking God, Father, there is something you've put in my heart that I can do. Even one meal to a street child, whatever the Lord has put in your heart, you're saying, I'll not live here without telling God what I will do. Father, you've been over gracious to me. You have been over generous to me. I want to reciprocate. If that is you, would you stand so that we pray together? I believe 
in doing action. Because by standing, you are telling thank you, thank you, thank you, lady, for those standing. By standing, you are telling yourself, you know what? This is a covenant between me and God. I give you a second. I give you a second. If you heard the voice of God, and God is telling you something that you can do, just stand up. Stand up wherever you are. I believe the Lord is talking to many of you, and you are struggling. Because some of you, God is saying, you are going to give this or that or the other. Love is expensive. It's costly obedience. Stand up. If you want the Lord to bless what you have decided to do, just stand up. Tell the Lord what you have decided. I'm calling the pastor to come and pray for us and make that covenant before the Lord. Never forget it. I've never forgotten 56 years ago and see where the Lord has taken me and see what the Lord is doing through these sons of ours. May God bless you as the pastor is coming. Amen. Everlasting Father, we thank you for this word this morning. We thank you, Lord that you appointed, that each one of us would be here to hear this word. And Lord, we open up our hearts and say yes to that which you're asking of us, Lord. We thank you for each and every person who's standing here this morning and just saying, Lord, they have heard your voice and they're willing to go the mile that you're asking them to. Lord, we pray for boldness. For some of the areas you're calling us to, Lord, they are tough, they are hard. They may look humanly impossible, but God, you know why you have laid that each specific request in each person's heart this morning. So we pray for your anointing, Lord. We pray for your grace. We pray for strength, Lord. We pray for provision. Because we know, Lord, where you've given a vision, you will provide. We pray for peace of heart and mind. We pray that, Lord, you will rally the right people, God, for the mission, the vision that you've given this day, Lord. Father, we thank you for those specific instructions. You receive them, and, Lord, we lift them to you as we ask you that you lead us, teach us, instruct us in the way that we should go, Lord, as we walk choose to walk in obedience to you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for Reverend Judy. God, we thank you for using her this morning. We speak a blessing over her, Lord. We thank you for her ministry, Lord. We thank you for the influence, Lord, that she's having, changing lives, oh God. May you bless her. May you supply. May you give her grace, Lord, to continue running this race, oh God. May she say like Caleb, that what she did 50, 40 years ago, she's doing it even with much more grace and strength in this season of her life. God, we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like more information about ICC Nairobi, you can follow us on all our social media platforms, that is Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at ICC underscore Nairobi or our website, iccnairobi.org. Be sure to subscribe and share this podcast with your family and friends. Until next time.